Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. I'm going to backtrack a little bit today. Let's go to Hebrews 9.12. The beauty of the epistle to the Hebrews, and I say it over and over again, is that we get to listen in on a conversation between a messenger from God and the leaders of the temple. Back in AD 68 when this letter was written, it was written for all time as a record, by the way, of something eternal. Not of something temporary, but something on an eternal basis, the eternality of which we cannot even imagine because we are creatures trapped in time. We don't understand what an eternal oath is. One of these days we will. Starting in Hebrews 9.12, we've been through this before, but I wanted to cover a couple of things. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The important word in that is the word once. And in the Greek language, it says once for all time, or once covering everything, a one-time thing, as we would a one-time deal, as we might say in English, having obtained eternal redemption. And the word eternal there reflects our redemption. If you have been redeemed, you are eternally redeemed, period. End of conversation. You're not going to lose your salvation. Assuming you have your salvation, it's eternal. And I use the word eternal knowing that I don't even know what that means, and neither do you. We don't know. We've got some concept of heaven as being a really nice place. But what it's like, do you ever find yourself wondering what you will look like in heaven, what you'll be doing on a daily basis, where you'll travel, who will say, I want you to go over here and do such and such and come back. And when you do, I want you to do something else. And you really need to do this while you're here. You need to talk to so-and-so while you're over there. What's going to be going on? You don't have the slightest idea what you're going to be doing throughout eternity, except you know you're going to be in the family of God. It's really astonishing. You talk about the big Christmas morning surprise. You don't know. And I think the reason we need to keep that at the front of our minds is that it's easy to get jaded and sort of mm, grind yourself down into a daily idea of your salvation, of your relationship with Christ, and how impatient you are for Jesus to come, and all these worldly things. But the Bible doesn't talk about this world nearly as much as it talks about eternality. And here we have eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? And here we have a reference to the red heifer. The red heifer is a very mysterious oblation in the Old Testament. Jewish tradition says that, that there were nine red heifers. And the law of the red heifer is that a red heifer without spot or blemish had to be taken outside of the wall, outside of the camp of Israel, and sacrificed by being slain and then burned to ashes. Those ashes then being very carefully scooped up and placed into a container called the kalal, and those ashes were suitable for purification. When you got low on ashes, the ashes of the red heifer, you would sacrifice another one, mix its ashes in with the ashes of the first one, and so on and on and on it would go. Jewish tradition says that there were nine red heifers which have been offered so far and that somewhere that kalal resides, and that they're going to find it. And some say they have already found it. You may remember Vendel Jones, the archaeologist, who wore a hat, sort of like the Indiana Jones archetype, and he sort of thought of himself as the Indiana Jones of the Middle East, and he believed that he had found the kalal, the ashes of the red heifer. He presented 
those to the Jewish authorities. So some people say the Jews already have the ashes of the preceding nine red heifers. The first red heifer was sacrificed by Moses and Eliezer, the second by Ezra the scribe. Two more were offered by Simon the righteous, Yohanan the high priest. A seventh one is said to have been offered by the prophet Elijah. The eighth one by Hanumel the Egyptian who became a Jewish proselyte and the ninth by Ishmael, the son of Piabi, in 15 AD, during the life of Christ. Jewish tradition says the tenth and final red heifer will be burned by the Messiah after he comes. So they are still depending on the idea of the ashes of the red heifer as a cleansing ritual. But the Bible says that the cleansing ritual has already been accomplished through Christ and not through the red heifer. So why a red heifer? Think about it. Matter of fact, it's very mysterious. It's a female offering. All the other temple offerings are male offerings. Offerings for sin are all male. Bulls and goats, sheep offered in a particular way on a particular day are male. But here a female instead of a bull is used, and you ask why? Well, sin came through Eve, so it has a female component. Came through Eve via the old serpent. Some people say the red heifer, well, this red heifer has to be perfectly red without a single white or off-colored hair. Red is the color of sin, so the red heifer is said to represent absolute sinfulness. This red heifer is expected never to have been yoked or used for any work. That is to say, it is to be perfectly holy, separate from all others of its type. It has to be burned outside the camp. Traditionally, the red heifers were burned over near or on the Mount of Olives. Usually, they were dedicated at the temple, taken across a bridge that used to exist between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, and then the whole ceremony would take place outside the camp on the Mount of Olives. You think about this. Some people have said, well, it can't be a type of Christ. It's a female. And yet the aspects of the red heifer and its sacrifice very much resemble Christ. He was very holy. He was separate from sinners. He was without spot or blemish. The blood of the red heifer during its burning has to be sprinkled seven times, indicative of completion. And the cedar and hyssop that are to be offered with the red heifer are symbols of the world to which this red heifer is dedicated. Jesus cleansed the world. He was destroyed. He was taken outside the camp. The principle of sin that is written all the way through the ritual of the red heifer, and I don't have time to go through the whole thing, really evokes the idea of Christ who was crucified outside the camp. Things in heaven are said to have been purified by his action. Leviticus 17.11 For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon an altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. That was true all the way through the days of the Old Testament. The sprinkled blood of the red heifer, the ashes of the red heifer mixed with water and then applied for cleansing are all symbols of the idea that sin came through blood and that sin has to be removed through blood. And by its definition, Judaism and later Christianity is a bloody religion. It simply has to be. It is the blood that is the cleansing factor in Christianity. And we are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have noticed that at times if you mention the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it makes people a little bit nervous. They kind of, Ooh, wait a minute, I don't want to talk about blood. And yet I live through his blood sacrifice. 
because his was a genetically perfect blood, which means that all the other blood on planet Earth before Jesus came was only symbolic. It was only capable of a symbolic cleansing that looked forward to the final, single, and effective cleansing brought through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Had he not shed his blood outside the camp in a prescribed way on a prescribed day, none of this would have been effective. And so the writer to the Hebrews says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? And I mentioned the first time through this that you have the Trinity there. You have Christ, the Spirit, and you have God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. He is the mediator of the new covenant, and the new covenant was certified through his blood. Verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Now we talked about this before. But I wanted to go through this one more time from a different perspective, and I wanted to talk about the idea of being a mediator. Verse 15, he is the mediator of the New Testament. The mediator of the New Testament. What he is, is our propitiation. God himself became the expiation of sin demanded by his holiness and his justice. God himself became the expiation demanded by his holiness. He demanded a certain level of holiness. No human being anywhere at any time was able to deliver that justice and that holiness a human being would have been incapable of delivering what was necessary, what was called for by the law to finally expiate sin. God himself became the expiation demanded by his own holiness and justice. But on the other side, there is not a thought in these verses that God placated himself. God did not say, I placate myself. There's nothing like that at all. That would have made him some kind of a tyrant. I demand a certain, I demand blood, I demand this, I demand that. And then when he gets all that, he says, I now have received all my demands and I have placated myself. There's not that in it at all. God is not that kind of a demanding God. There's no thought here when we talk about propitiation, which these verses begin to talk about now, and we're going to get more and more into it, of God saying, I placate myself, or rendering himself conciliatory to himself, or of appeasing his own anger. God is an angry God, and I'm going to keep on being angry until I get the kind of appeasement I want. There's nothing like that. It's not God demanding a certain kind of holiness and then in a very rude, cantankerous, and mean way saying, all you people are incapable of giving it to me. I'm going to give it to myself. It was not that at all. Propitiation, the Greek word is helasterion. It means more than to cover. In the Old Testament, you have Yom Kippur, that one day a year, spoken of here in Hebrews several times, where the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, sprinkled blood on the Ark of the Covenant, and that action of sprinkling blood was called covering. In fact, that's the name of the Jewish festival, Yom Kippur. 
in Hebrew, Yomim Kafarim, the day of covering, or the ten days of covering. Yomim Kafarim is the plural. Yom Kippur is the singular. It is the day of covering. It's the day when the high priest goes in, sprinkles blood on the mercy seat, and the sins of the twelve tribes are covered for one year. But covering is just an archetype. Covering is not the real thing. The real thing is propitiation. The real thing is that now God has not been expiated through his own demand for holiness. He has not placated himself. He has not reconciled things unto himself. He hasn't appeased his own anger. All those thoughts would be ridiculous. What God has done is perform a legal operation. The judge, God, through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, takes upon himself the penalty of the one whom he has judged to be guilty and thus can show mercy. It would be like going into a courtroom and you're guilty of sin and you're standing there before the judge and the judge now delivers sentence and he says, son, you're guilty of sin, but I love you. As judge, I have the power take upon myself your sentence and I'm going to go do your jail time. You're free. What judge in history has ever done that? One. <laughs> and only one that I know of. So we're not talking about appeasement of an angry God. We're not talking about placation. We're not talking about God self-satisfied. We're talking about propitiation, hilasterion, as being the payment of a legal penalty by the only one who can really pay the penalty and can thus show mercy. The judgment seat then becomes the mercy seat. The judgment seat becomes the mercy seat. The judgment seat in the Old Testament becomes the mercy seat. Now, as human beings, we try to live good lives or if we can't, we try to stay at least as far away from the law as we can. Because, you know, getting mixed up with the legal system is not a good thing. You just try to stay away from that. You try to drive according to the rules and not steal and you don't hit anybody and stuff like that. The whole idea being to stay out of the legal system. Sadly, however, we were all born in sin, and we have all fallen short of the glory of God, and upon our birth, we were all involved in the legal system from birth. We were born in sin, having come short of the glory of God, but God, through his love, devised a legal construct whereby we could be pardoned. That's what this is all about. Now, the writer to the Hebrews is writing to these people who continually perform ritual reconciliation or ritual appeasement. And bit by bit by bit, as you go through Hebrews, he's teaching them and he's teaching us at the same time that you simply cannot look at what God did as some kind of an appeasement. It's not what it is. It's more like a satisfaction than it is an appeasement. You know, all the other gods in the world demand appeasement. You had to sacrifice to Baal and Moloch. You had to bring your newborn child and throw him on the fire. He had to be appeased. Our God doesn't have to be appeased. Our God is involved with creation. He's involved with reconciliation. He's involved with the legal restoration of the broken universe. Bring us back to the red heifer. Sin came through Eve via the Old Testament and the serpent. The Old Testament is the story of the fall of the serpent, the contest between the serpent and humanity bound up in a mysterious way, the sacrifice of the red heifer is this story of how you have all the symbols that were written into the tabernacle 
are used to illustrate that which God is later going to do. Verse 17 of chapter 9, For a testament is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated or confirmed without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now we've already gone through this a couple of times. All of the elements that satisfied God in the tabernacle are simply shadows of the realities of those same things in heaven. It's hard to imagine, hard for us to imagine, that the things on earth are just models of the real things that are in heaven. There really is a real tabernacle. There is a real temple. There is a real system of worship in heaven that is modeled by all of the instruments and constructions that God showed to Moses. Verse 23, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So, essentially, the idea that's emerging with great clarity is that the Old Testament, as we call it, is true and complete, but it's only a rehearsal for the actuality that occurred when Christ came. All those things that had been ritually acted out year after year after year after year in the tabernacles and in the temples, Christ took and elevated to the heavenly level once for all time, leaving behind this earthly worship. Now this is the great mystery. To me it's a mystery and biblically it's a great mystery. Why would he do that? This is a huge question. Why would God receive Christ as the complete fulfillment of all that was required on a legal basis? This happened with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and Jesus said on the cross to Telestai, it is finished, it has been paid in full, it's done. There's a whole done deal. And what came next was the giving of the Holy Spirit and the age of the church. Why would God have done this leaving behind the bulk of His people and their temple? Think about it. Because what happened after He ascended to heaven? For 40 years after he ascended to heaven, the great temple was still in 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation. The priests were all there making priestly sacrifices. People were bringing their lambs and their goats and their various offerings and so forth to the temple. And the feasts of Israel were being celebrated for 40 years. Meanwhile, over here, the work had already been done and a group of people called the apostles were out traipsing around the Roman Empire, spreading the gospel, leaving the people in Jerusalem and the temple fully operating a system that was now outmoded, totally outmoded. Isn't that strange that God would work that way? Why would He do that? In fact, it wasn't just for 40 years. Then the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., and then in 135 A.D., the Jews were in diaspora all over the world. What's the hope, the national hope of the Jew? The temple and the Messiah. They want to rebuild the thing that was burned in A.D. 70 and get it started again. But when we read Hebrews, we know that there's really no necessity for that. It's already been done. And the earthly temple, no matter how beautiful it was, is just an archetype. 
that stood for a while until the real thing came along. So you look at this ninth chapter that has the word blood in it six times, starting in verse 18, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Verse 19, chapter 10, he took the blood of calves and of goats. Verse 20, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Verse 21, moreover he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Verse 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. That's number five. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's number six. There are six times there in rapid succession, verses 18 through 22, that blood is mentioned. And followed by this statement, which we read, it's therefore necessary the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What's better than the blood of a bull or the blood of a goat or the blood of a sheep? What is better than that? The blood of Christ. For Christ has not entered to the holy places made with hands, which are now the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So I'm still asking the question, why would God have preserved the national hope of Israel when it was totally outmoded by the finished work of Christ? Are your heads spinning like my head is spinning? There are a lot of big ideas here. First of all, there is the prophecy of the kingdom of David. And that prophecy has not been fulfilled. And it was foretold by the Old Testament prophets who were prior to and contemporary with David. David was promised a house and a kingdom. And the promise of the house and the kingdom included the indwelling presence of God who would come and be seated on his throne and would rule and reign. Okay, that prophecy has never been fulfilled. It has to be fulfilled because God has to prove something. And I'm going to just run past this briefly. What does God have to prove? He has to prove once and for all to all who will watch, to any who will learn, he has to prove that man cannot be satisfactorily regulated through an earthly kingdom. Can't be done. And what's the proof? Proofs in the Bible. Prophecy. It prophesies that the king will return in the air. The people will acknowledge that the returned Lord Jesus is the king who will sit upon the throne of David. A fourth temple will be rebuilt. A beautiful millennial temple is going to be built. Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne there, rule and reign for a thousand years, thus fulfilling that prophecy made to the kingdom of David, which has never been fulfilled yet. And then what happens at the end of the thousand year reign? Open rebellion, global disaster, a horrific series of events that lead to a humongous if I may use that non-biblical word, cataclysm, followed by a new heavens and a new earth. We're not done yet. It's like we think Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. It's finished. Yes, it is for those who will receive him. But for the world, it's not finished. The world still has to go through World War III. The world still has to go through the seven years of tribulation. The king has to come in the air followed by his armies and establish the throne of David. And that wonderful fourth temple has to be rebuilt and he's going to rule and reign. We're going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. I don't know what we're going to be doing, but we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. And his temple is going to be the most beautiful place ever built, but it's going to come to one thing. Destruction at the end of the thousand years. Rebellion, disaster, and destruction. So the prophecy of the kingdom of David is a prophecy that offers the final proof that man is incapable in his physical state of 
self-regulation. We are engaged in a very long and very complex, if you will, battle that involves legalities, it involves lawsuits, it involves contests. Remember Job chapter 1 where the Lord called a court and the angels of the Lord were seated there and guess which angel of the Lord came in through the side door and sat down? Well, it was Satan. Came in and joined the discussion as an equal. That hasn't changed. He still has access. He has access to the throne of God to this very day. He still considers himself a player. He still is the number one force on planet Earth. He owns all the best real estate. He figures he's got a pretty good shot at controlling the Earth. He offered it to Jesus when Jesus came for the first time. He said, you know, I can give you this whole thing to rule if you'll just allow me to continue to be a player in the world scene. Jesus looks at him and says, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So there's this long contest that cannot be solved through an earthly temple, no matter how perfect and how beautiful it is. And the story of the Bible is an illustration of how impossible it is for the solution to come through any earthly means whatsoever. The only way reconciliation can come is through the blood of Jesus. And miraculously, while this contest on earth is still being fought over here, you and I are not on earth anymore. And you say, well, it looks like I'm on earth. You know, I still feel gravity. You know, when I take a step, my shoes slap against the ground. It certainly looks like I'm on earth. But several places in the New Testament, it says concerning us, you are citizens of heaven. That's where your passport is, in heaven. You are a citizen of heaven, not of earth. You just think you are a citizen of earth. You're not. Who is? Unsaved people certainly are citizens of earth. Who else? The 12 tribes. Because it is through the 12 tribes that all of these future prophecies concerning the kingdom of David are going to be worked out. And God has temporarily set them aside while he's doing this other thing through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this other thing is the real thing. Whereas the blood spilled in temple ritual sacrifice is not the real thing. By the grace of God, and I say that by the grace of God, we got a shortcut. We don't have to go around the Monopoly board one more time. <laughs> Pass go and collect $200. We go straight to heaven. And this is the wonderful thing that the writer to the Hebrews is trying to tell the Hebrews. Now, remember, you have Hebrews, you have Jews, and you have Israelites. In the New Testament, a Hebrew is considered to be an intellectual Jew. A Jew is the word used for a national Jew in terms of his citizenship. And an Israelite is considered to be a spiritual Jew. Remember when Jesus came to Nathanael and chose him as an apostle, he sort of joked with Nathanael and he said, Ah, here is an Israelite indeed. What was he saying? He was saying, this is a spiritual man. Nathaniel is a spiritual man, and I'm going to choose him to be one of my own. This whole amazing interplay, for Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, that is, on our behalf. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others, Notice the word others here. The high priest is going into that tabernacle with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It's fascinating here that you have the word world mentioned twice in verse 26. 
what you have there is that the first word world is cosmos, meaning age. The second time the word world is mentioned is the Greek word ionos or eon. And so what he's saying here is for then must he have oft suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world, the age, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He's talking about the end of the dispensation of law and the beginning of the dispensation of grace here. And so you don't have to struggle to discover the concept of dispensationalism. It's in the Bible. There was an age of law. And now, once in the end of this eon, or this, as we would say, dispensation, dispensation of law, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered to bear the sins of many. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He's not speaking of the rapture here at all, but of his coming to judge the earth. That's what he's talking about here. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. That's the second coming, to judge the earth. However, believers will not come into judgment. When he appears the second time, it will not be to settle the sin question. That's already been settled once and for all time when he gave his own blood. If you look carefully at verse 28, it says, Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And the word, it's a Greek word for unto is ace. It's spelled in English E-I-S, pronounced ace, translated as unto. But the real meaning of the word ace is for the purpose or in the subject of or, or having relation to. So it says unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin in relation to or having to do with salvation. He's already settled the sin question. When he comes the second time, it's going to be for the purpose of salvation. Well, what will need saving? when he comes back the second time. The world will have to be saved. The world will be essentially on the verge of self-destruction, and then he's going to appear like a light in the heavens. Every eye shall see him. People will express various kinds of emotions. The 12 tribes are going to fall down and weep and wail when they finally realize Christ Jesus is their Messiah. Matthew 24 has a little description of that. He's coming back the second time to save the world. He did not come the first time to save the world. He came the first time to settle the sin question. It's been settled. Period. Anyone wants to talk to you, you've got the answer to the sin question. Somebody comes knocking on your door, I got a lot of questions about sin and the sin question. I'm not even sure I know anything about it at all. I don't know whether I'm saved or not. Would you talk to me? Sure, come on in. I'll talk to you. You're going to sit down. Have a Coke. Whatever. We got a lot to talk about. So I can talk to this person about sin because the sin question has been answered. The salvation question has not been answered. The world hasn't been saved. And that's what it says here. This is pretty advanced reasoning. The writer to the Hebrews is presenting this to a people who think that they can save the world through the ritual observance of law. And they're dead wrong. And what he's trying to tell them is the salvation question, that is the question of how to handle sin, has been dealt with one time, and that's all it's going to take, just the one time. There are a lot of other questions that have not been dealt with. 
as we get into verse 1 of chapter 10, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. That's what he's saying here. If you come to settle the sin question and you bring your offering to the temple and it's ritually offered in a particular way at a particular time by a particular man, it doesn't solve a single problem. That's what he says in verse 1 here. The law having been a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of things which Jesus is. In fact, the word here for the very image is the very icon. Jesus is the very icon of things. But the law and ritual observance of the law is not. For the law, having been a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. The word that sticks out in that sentence to me is the word never. <laughs> never. If you're coming to God through ritual sacrifice, you will never, that's a long time, never solve the sin question. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? In other words, if these offerings were effective, why keep giving them? Which is a rhetorical question. Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. If you go and have your sins cleansed, at that point in time, you shouldn't have any awareness of sin anymore. Your sin's been covered. It's a done deal. You can now go do other things. You don't have to worry about this anymore. And by the way, you don't have to worry about sin anymore as a question that separates you from God. That question has already been answered. From this point on, it's your duty to become more and more educated as to what God has been doing all these years. Verse 3 says, But in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year. For it's not possible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh to the worlds, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings, sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it's written of me, to do thy will, O God. Those first five verses in chapter 10 are going to take all next hour. Because Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, are quoted here as the ultimate illustration of what Jesus has done. And what's fascinating is, that if you turn back to Psalm 40, verse 6, and read that, let's just do it before we finish today. You turn back to Psalm 40, and scholars have spent much ink discussing these verses. Psalm 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. You read Psalm 40, verse 6, and it says, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, mine ears hast thou opened. So you turn back to Hebrews, and you read the quotation in Hebrews. It says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Oops, what's wrong? It's not quoting the same Psalm 40, verse 6, I have back in my Psalms. It's quoting some other Psalm 40, verse 6. Isn't that interesting? We're going to discuss why next week. And the why is really neat. We'll look at that next time.